This series of lectures is a part of an ongoing endeavor to spread knowledge and awareness about Islamic economics. In doing so, this series questions the worldview created by Western economic theories. Western economic sciences have been widely believed as the authentic representation of reality by Muslims. The spread of capitalism has promoted a culture of rationalizing unethical selfish behavior, greed, and competition which has had an enormous bearing on humanity. In this context, Dr. Asad Zaman has a lifelong research and experience along with the much needed insight into the deep rooted flaws in Western knowledge. In this series uh, of lectures, Dr. Asad Zaman will show how Western mainstream economics is based on several assumptions and suffers a normative bias, and how it contrasts with Islamic economics. Uh, he is currently the Vice Chancellor of Pakistan Institute of Development Economics and has previously served as the Director General International Institute of Islamic Economics, International Islamic University, Islamabad. Over to Dr. Asad Zaman. Many, many ideas of the West have become widespread, widely accepted, widely believed by Muslims and completely wrong. One of them I mentioned was the idea that money is the only criteria of progress. If one nation has more money than the other, then it is more developed. If one nation is poor, then it is less developed. This is wrong. But this is what is widely believed. So, Islam teaches us many, many things which are nur, which there is no conception of in the West. So, in order to understand this ayat, we need to learn what is Islam teaching us and then to compare it with the West and what they are teaching. And that's, yani, economics is only one field. In every field, there are big problems uh, when you start doing this. And then you start understanding why Islam has a much superior system. But unfortunately, the Muslims have all forgotten what their system is. So, let me start by asking, um, what is your intention in sitting here? You are sitting here listening to my talk. Why are you sitting here? What, 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 do, you, what do you expect to gain by this? Yes, somebody. Your ideas about Islamic yes, and but why? why? Yeah, more because pleasant weather outside. <laughs> <laughs> In the name of God, uh, our intention uh, is to derive the Islamic economy system from uh, the uh, resource of Islam, uh, Quran, Sunnah, and other. Uh, the system coincide with uh, Islam. Uh, we uh, we believe the Western economy is not complete, wrong, but in the some ways and some consumption coincide with other. Uh, Islam, but in some ways not. It is completely wrong. Hmm. Okay. Anybody else want to say? It's okay. You don't have to any force. Uh, if if there is something. Now the question is, why am I asking this? I am asking this because Islam teaches us that innam al amal bin niyat. So, what the outcome from my sitting here and your sitting here will depend on the niya with which we sit. So, <clears throat> it is very important at the beginning of every amal to make sure that the niyat is correct. Because with the wrong niyat, the 
amal can be wasted. So, for example, it can be that people sit in my Islamic economics course in because they want to get degree. After get degree, then they will get job in Islamic banking, and then they will be happy. So, this is one niyat, but this is not the niyat that I would like to have in my students. So, what is my niyat? You should understand that, and then. See, in uh, my understanding, every single Muslim who has said the kalama la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah is extremely precious to Allah. That Allah Taala has created man in ahsan taqwim, and some as well as hafilin. So inside every human being. There is the potential to be higher than the angels, and also the potential to be worse than the beasts. So now, to me, the every single youth in the ummah the Muslima has the possibility to change the whole world, and it has happened many times before. But today, the Muslims. Youth have, in general, made a very small intention about what to do with their lives. So, the average person, the average young man, wants to sell his life in return for some comforts of this dunya only. So, with this kind of very low intention. Very low results will be obtained. So, if we want to think that, okay, I will learn something and I will make a career, and my name will be known, it's not, not meaningful. So, we have to make big azam that I will, uh, I will do everything that I can to change the. Course of history to bring the message of Allah into the lives of all the people living on this planet. So, if we make this intention, then everything we do will have an impact on the, every human being living on this planet because it is in the hands of Allah. According to our azm, He will deal with us. So, إذا عزمت فتوكلت على الله. So, if we make a big intention, we can have big impact. So I am sitting here because I see that these twelve people, I think that every one of them can change the world. So I am trying to inspire them to do this and to use their lives in a precious and meaningful way, and not think that if somebody gives me a job for hundred thousand dollars, then this is big thing for me and this is the most, because this is what the world has deceived you into believing. The world has deceived you, the capitalist system, and the capitalist system works like this. It manufactures machines. Every single human being is turned into a part for a machine. So every single individuality, every single piece of something which is me uniquely, Allah Taala has created every human being differently. What um, what? You have your life. Nobody else has experienced how you were brought up, how many brothers and sisters you had, what experiences you had, what kind of relationship you have with Allah. This is unique. Nobody else can ever know it. So, <clears throat> every human being is a treasure, infinitely valuable, beyond price. It cannot be purchased with the treasures of the world. But this is directly in conflict with uh, all the economic theory that we learn, and also the whole idea of the capitalistic system. Because capitalism will not work if there is no labor. What is labor? Labor is a sale, a sale of human beings' time for money. Now, everybody understands that uh, that. To sell human being for money is not a good thing. 
and we would not sell ourselves for money. But if we sell a small amount of time, it is the same thing. So, this uh, is one of the ideas that capitalism has imposed on the minds of the people, which is actually, as I said, darkness. There are lots of things which are darkness, which are being portrayed as light. One of these is the idea of the labor market. The idea of the labor market that people can go and sell themselves on the labor market for wage, that this is legitimate, permissible, acceptable. This is wrong. We need to give, we need to find a way, create an economy in which every human life is meaningful. Now, this is something which Muslims can understand, which other people cannot understand. So this is what I would like to explain to you as one of the points of this lecture. The labor market from an Islamic point of view, the labor market from a Western point of view. On the one hand, this is an abstract concept. On the other hand, it's very immediate and concrete because you are part of the labor market. So if you understand what I'm saying, it will change how you live your life. So, in the Western conception of the labor market, suppose that I am running a factory. I hire you. I will pay you $100 a day and you will work in my factory. Now, your work, your, your life Let's say you work eight hours. So I have purchased your time and in return for money. This I say is wrong. This is, this is the wrong way to conceive of the business and this is not the Islamic way. Now, in the Islamic way, what happens? I'm talking about the spirit here, not the fiqh. Uh, I'm not talking about haram and halal, but the preferred method of Islamic. The, so, uh, don't get um, um, uh, confused by the technical um, Sharia laws. We can get to those also, but those are, that's more complicated. <clears throat> I'm just talking about the Islamic spirit at this time. The spirit is that all of our actions are ibadah. So, if I am running a factory, if I have a bakery and I am producing bread, then my intention should be to provide a service to the community, which is to provide them with bread. It is not the intention that by doing this service, I will earn money. Now, because this has become so widespread that even Muslims find this confusing and, and not correct and they argue against it. So, let me shift the example a little bit and then we will come back to this. In all societies, whether Muslim or Kafir, um, the idea of the doctor, the one who um, looks after sick patients, this has always been a service. People learn doctoring in order to help those who are in need. In Islam, there is a lot of emphasis. If you help somebody, this is khidmah, and it is beyond ibadah. And if somebody is making um, fasting all day and, and uh, making uh, prayer um, all the time, and the other person is just giving medicine to the patients, he is earning more hasanat. This is many, 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 many ahadiths clarify that khidmah uh, and, and service to mankind is superior to ibadah. Uh, so, in all societies, including our societies, the idea that we learn medicine because we can serve human beings and thereby earn hasanat and become uh, closer to God. This, is, this has been the way. But, 
the spread of capitalism has changed that. In the past 30 years, it's not a, it's not a very long time, 30, 40 years it has been spreading now. The student goes into medicine, why? Because he wants to make a lot of money. They have interviews at our medical schools. One of them asked, you know, uh, public medicine, one of the students who was being interviewed asked, well, what would be the effect of um, if there is a spread of a disease, widespread, so disease becomes widespread. So what, what would be the effect of that and what could we do about it? So the student says, the effect will be doctors will make a lot of money. Such low thinking in Muslim countries, in Muslims. This is, this is the effect of capitalism. This is where... Um, they used, they did not use to think like this. Even the kuffar didn't think like this. But now they have started. And this has infected the Muslims also. That they are thinking in this way. That the goal of life is to make money. This is completely ridiculous. This is not true. Um, and this is both yani, from the religious point of view. And also from the point of view of acquiring your potential, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ This is very harmful. Every human being <coughs> inside him, every Muslim, there is the seed of Iman. The La ilaha illallah is the seed. From this a tree can grow and the tree is described in the Quran. It is said that this is the tree where the roots are in the in the ground, but the branches are in the skies. This is if the uh, growth is achieved. But the growth requires hard work. Just like to become a doctor requires hard work, you have to study five years and lots of, do lots of things in order to become a doctor. So, to become a mu'min requires hard work. It's not automatic. It requires that you work on many qualities, many characteristics you have to have. Isar, you have to have compassion, you have to have um, Iman. There are many things, they are listed. The Quran is full of directions on how to become Saleh. But we don't know these. We know how to become good economist, but not. this is not taught in our universities, how to become a mu'min. So, coming back to the labor market, the Muslim who is running a bread shop, he will be thinking about the service he is providing, that he is providing good bread and he is doing a lot of hard work so people can have in the morning, they can have fresh bread and it makes him happy that he is able to provide this service. Now, he is charging money from people, but this money is a means to providing a service. You see, he says, if I were to distribute this bread for free every morning, then I will run out of money. I will not be able to provide this service for maybe two or three days. Then I've closed down shop. I don't have any more money. So, this profit that he earns is a way that he can serve people for 10 years or 20 years, 30 years. If, if he didn't charge people money, he would not be able to provide this service. So this is 100% opposite of the Western conception of business. The Western conception of business is that service is provided as a means to make money. The Islamic spirit is that money is earned as a means to provide the service. 100% different. Now, if we are, now you are an, my employee in this bakery. You are running the, you are opening the oven and putting the bread in and taking it out and I I am paying you money but now when we are thinking of this as a service you are also part of the service so you are also earning hasanat so the payment is only a way it's an arrangement if uh, you would be happy to do this for free but you have to support your family you have to eat so I provide you money so that so as to enable you to do the service not that I am buying your time. I am not buying your time. I cannot buy your time. Time is too expensive. Human beings are 
too expensive to be brought and sold. So again, when it's bakery, then because the Western model is so dominant, people have forgotten how it works. So if we think about masjid, then it becomes clearer. Now I hire somebody to clean the bathroom of the masjid. He is very happy, Muslim. He says that I am doing something which is earning hasanat. He is not thinking that I am doing something very bad or very demeaning. Or, because he understands that this allows people to make ibadah. And he says that when I allow this, then every person who is coming in and using, I am getting hasanat from his namaz, from his salat. So this is an entirely different way of thinking about business. So, the idea that human beings can be bought and sold, capitalist idea, Islamic idea is different. All of our businesses are directed towards service. So, once you understand this, then you see the... When you are getting a job offer, then the capitalist thinking is that job X, he is giving me $100,000 per month. Job Y, I am getting 75000 So, I will take job X. I don't need to ask, what is the job? Because it doesn't matter. I'm, uh, my concern is only with the 100000 But from the service point of view, if job X is selling um, something harmful, it's, maybe it's pornography and job Y is um, selling something useful and you will say, okay, I will take less money but I will do something which is useful. So, this makes a difference then because you are not concerned with money, now you are concerned with the service. So, just like this, in economics, Many ideas have been spread and popularized and accepted by Muslims which are simply wrong. And so, in Islamic economics, we need to unlearn these ideas and we need to show that these ideas are wrong and we need to provide an alternative. And so, I said that the, the basic idea, the root of the capitalism is the idea that life is about making money. Money is the only measure of progress. So if I have more money than you, then I am in a better shape. And then you must try to be like me. In the Quran there is mention of a story of a man who who had a lot of money and he was priding himself and he was saying to the other man, oh, you have very little money. And so the other man said to him that you should not talk like that. You know this story, right? And he said you should make shukr to Allah that Allah has given you. And if you don't, then Allah can take it all away. And it happened like that because he was very um, proud man. So he, one day he went and there was no garden. He was very upset what happened to Magar, Allah Ta'ala had destroyed it because he was not making shukr. So the standard of the kuffar is directly opposed to the standard of the Qur'an. So the standard of the kuffar is that money is the only standard. Iran, yeah, we do a ranking of the world, which country is highest, which country is less. How do we do this? Which has more money it is the highest, which has less money it's and if one country is making zulm after zulm after zulm, this doesn't get counted into the GNP. It's still the leader of the world. And if one country is doing very good deeds, but it has less money, doesn't matter, it doesn't add to the GNP. So, this is not the Islamic standard. So, this is just one idea which is wrong. There are hundreds of wrong ideas. Unfortunately, widely accepted. In the Pakistan, the Ministry of Planning, Economic and Development, what are they doing? They are studying how we can make more money for Pakistan. They are not studying how to make the people of Pakistan less corrupt 
how to introduce honesty, amana, trust, cooperation, confidence, the concept of ummah, nothing. The Ministry of Economics is studying how we can make more money. Why? Because the kuffar say making money is the only thing which matters. And this is wrong. Actually, developing human beings is what matters. What the Prophet ﷺ did was to develop human beings. He took people who were very bad in some ways. One of the Sahaba writes that he had buried his own daughter alive in his jahiliya. And he was very regretful of this. When Islam came, he was very ashamed and embarrassed. So this is the thing that we need to teach the Muslims first. How to live Islam in ourselves 100% and how to spread it to others. This is the criteria. Now, this effort to create Islamic economics has been going on for a long time. In fact, Bakr Sadr was one of the founding leaders of this idea that we need to have an Islamic economics. <clears throat> In our country, it was Maududi. And there are a few other names, but these two are the principal. Bakr Sadr and Maududi, these two are the main figures who founded the movement for Islamic economics. But what happened is this movement has gotten derailed. It is no longer going in the direction that Bakr Sadr and Maududi wanted it to go. I want to tell you a little bit of why we are on the wrong track right now. You see, at that time when Imam Bakr Sadr and Maududi were working, uh, the, there was no Islamic government. Uh, in Pakistan, there was colonial rule first, and following that, there was the rulers were very much secular-minded people, and they were not interested in building economy according to Islamic principles. They were interested in building economy according to Western principles, same as today, actually, in Pakistan, anyway. So, <clears throat> uh, at that time, Islamic system was an abstraction, an idea in the head. It didn't have any practical implications. So, as far as the idea is concerned, the uh, Bakr Sadr and, and Maududi, they both wrote very nicely about how Islamic system would be very different from capitalism, it would be very different from Marxism, it would be very different from socialism. And they explained how capitalism has a lot of defects and it causes many problems for human beings and how Islamic system would provide a very nice alternative, it would provide justice for everybody, it would provide many, many good things. But these were people, they were writing about ideas. They were not actually implementing them. Then what happened was that the, to some extent, Muslims had some power to do something. So now, You are a Muslim in the Ministry of Economic Affairs. What are you going to do? There are two options. Uh, you can say that there is revolution and then there is evolution. Either you can change things gradually or you can just throw everything away and start from zero. Now, the ideas of Maududi and Bakar Sadr 
require revolution. They say throw everything away and <clears throat> start from zero, build an econ Islamic economy from zero. Now, um, before I go on, um, uh, the other idea is evolution. We take, we take um, whatever is whatever system is working, and change it little by little to make it Islamic. So before I go on, I want to understand, uh, get some feedback. Is this what I'm saying clear? Do people understand what I'm saying? And which do you favor? Do you think that we can? Bring an Islamic economics, should we bring it by revolution or should we do it by evolution? What can some feedback so that I have an idea of how much you are following what I am saying? Yes? Uh, I think that uh, we should uh, have a revolution because uh, we, we, not, uh, we not believe that uh, some of the foundation of. Uh, <coughs> Western economy. Yes, so you think that to bring Islamic system we need revolution. Yes. Anybody else? Any other ideas? Okay. Actually, <clears throat> many people said this that we need to have revolution, but the uh, pragmatic view, practical view said that revolution isn't going to happen in Pakistan. Iran, you mashallah, achieved it. There's another problem with the Iran. I will, I will get to the problem with the Irani experience, but you achieved revolution. But nearly all over the Islamic world, people could not do it. Not, not only could not do it, but they could not um, even think that it is possible. So then, for those people, unlike Iran, the situation is that either we just give up, we are not going to do anything, or we try the evolution approach. There is no other option. And revolution is not going to happen, because they just see that there is not enough spirit in the people to make revolution. So, <clears throat> then they said, okay, Let's do it gradually. Let's take the Western system and change it little by little to make it Islamic. This is what's happening in Pakistan, what's happening in Indonesia, Malaysia, Saudi, many other places. The only places where there has been revolution is Afghanistan and Iran, and to some extent Sudan also. They have a revolutionary experience. So now, <clears throat> the evolution was very dangerous because what happened was that people said, okay, so we have to take the Western system and we have to change it, make it Islamic. That means that we have to understand what the system is. That means we have to study Western economics. So lots of people, the, all the famous Islamic economists of this time, not the old ones, the current ones. They have all studied, they have all PhDs in Islamic economics, uh, in sorry, in uh, regular Western economics. Now, unlike the pioneers like Madhudi and Bakr Sadr, <coughs> these latecomers, they were brainwashed. They learned to accept Western economics on its face value. The Western economics say that this is a positive science. That just like you have the law of gravity, so you have the law of supply and demand. Now this is wrong. It is not true that law of supply and demand is like law of gravity. You see, when the stone is falling, it doesn't matter that 
underneath it there is a mu'min or underneath there is kafir. It will crush both of them equally with the same force. It does not make sense to say that let's have Islamic law of gravity. It's, it's meaningless. Supply and demand is not like that. Supply and demand is not a physical law. It is a agreement among people. And this agreement can be changed. For example, if there is supply and demand for cigarettes, but tomorrow a fatwa is issued that cigarette is haram and Muslims believe it, demand disappears. So it is according to my will and your will and my understanding and your understanding. If somebody very powerful comes and shows and explains that this is the argument and everybody believes him, suddenly dishonor disappears. But if somebody makes the argument and people don't believe, said, no, I don't think, I think this is wrong on this ground and that ground, it's not haram, demand is different. So it depends on our thinking and our um, decision and depends on many things. So it's not like law of gravity. So the economist said that this subject we teach the theory of supply and demand, utility theory, uh, firms profit maximization, efficiency of markets, many other ideas. They said this is just facts. There are no opinions in this. There is the famous normative positive distinction which you might have read. Do you know about this? So normative is values. Such and such thing is good. This is bad. We say with normative values we don't consider in economics. It's all purely objective, purely scientific. So our um, second generation, let's call it the Islamic economist, they accepted Western theories as being fact, as being objective, as being scientific, as true, as something which you cannot dispute in terms of being whether it's Islamic or not. Because it's fact. I can't call that this table is Islamic or this table is not Islamic. This table. <clears throat> because they accepted this and this was not true they went astray and now for the past 25 years people have been trying to create Islamic economics and they have failed they have failed because they are trying to mix our university was founded on this idea I am from International Institute of Islamic Economics and the idea of this was exactly what you are also doing here that teach the students Sharia, Fiqh, Arabic, um, all of the Islamic ulum on one side, economics on the other side, and mix up the two, and we will get Islamic economics. But this cannot be done. This cannot be done because the economics that the West has is not fact, it's not true, it is uh, zulamat, it is not nur. So, <clears throat> It consists, many ideas in, in, Islam, in, in Western economics are exactly opposed to Islamic ideas. They are contradicting each other. So you cannot mix the two because you either take one or you take the other. You can't have both. So, if you, so that's why it cannot succeed to create Islamic economics like this. Um, because these two things are not independent bodies of knowledge. This is what the people who started this project in our university, here, elsewhere, they had the idea that this is one set of facts, the economics, and Islam is another set of facts, it's also true, and so we just combine the two haq and we will get Islamic economics, but it's not true, this, this, Isla, this Western economics is batil, so you cannot combine haq and batil, and so the original people, the Baqir Sadr and Maududi, they didn't have any um, confusion about this, they understood that this uh, Western economics is wrong. But they didn't have any study. They didn't have any deep study. They didn't study utility theory and maximization and um, profits and so on. They just looked at it from the outside. Now, the, when the people get got inside, then they got confused. So, 
Now again we are in difficulty in this project because um, of this wrong idea. So this is the first thing that we have to reject the western economics in order to build Islamic economics. But the rejection must be an informed rejection at this time. Yani, unlike Bakr Sadr and Maududi who didn't, who could not do calculus, didn't know calculus. The, today the rejection must be done using econometrics and using calculus and using profit micro. It's a temporary need of the time. It's not that this is something that has to be done at all times. But the thing is that when something is very powerful, when everybody is impressed with it, then you must, uh, then you must uh, deal with it. You cannot say it's all nonsense. Just don't worry about it. Just don't bother with it. This is like uh, the Ummah has faced this problem before. When the, in the time of Harun Rashid <coughs> And uh, those khulafa, the works of the Greek philosophers were translated into uh, Arabic. Now, the Greek philosophers had very complicated and intricate theories about everything. The Muslims who read those were very impressed because in our tradition there was nothing like this. Our traditions were very simple intellectually compared to the Greeks. So <clears throat> the Muslims were very impressed. And in general, uh, there was this group of the Mu'tazala who um, argued that reason is on par with faith. So what can be derived by logic should be accepted just like what we accept from the Quran, from the Wahi and from the... <clears throat> they argued this and this was accepted by the kings, the Khalifas. So they tried to force this on all the Muslims. And they tried to force everybody to become Mu'tazala. And to accept the idea that reason is the same as Wahi. That it can lead to equally certain conclusions. So I don't doubt anything in this Quran. And also, anything which can be proven by logic, it should be equally valid. Fortunately, um, some great Muslims accepted to be tortured and accepted to be punished, but they did not accept to reject the Islamic idea that Wahi is superior to every everything, all human reason. Because of their courage and because of the help of Allah, the um, Mu'tazala were eventually defeated. And um, this did not become uh, part of Islamic religion, Greek philosophy. Otherwise, you know what would have happened. Even today, some Muslims are regretting this, that logic should be on par. But what they were calling, Mu'tazila were calling logic was not logic as it is understood today. It was Greek philosophy. One of the logic part of the idea was that the world is the center of the universe. And if the Mu'tazila had succeeded, then Muslims would believe that yes, the world is the center of the universe. And many other ideas coming from logic from Greeks like if two bodies <coughs> fall, uh, are dropped, then the heavier body will fall faster. And many such things. Many of the things which they thought the Mu'tazila said that this is logic and this is same as Wahi have all been proven wrong. Nearly all of the Greek ideas about science have been 90% have been proven wrong. And th those are the ideas that they wanted to put on par with the Wahi. So, uh, one of the very important episodes in this was Imam Ghazali. He wrote Tahafatul uh, Falaswa in which he rejected all of the wrong ideas of the Greek philosophy. And so <clears throat> that was very important because the prestige of the Greek philosophy was broken. So today, after that, you don't know what Greek philosophy is. I don't know. It's all been forgotten. 
it's not necessary anymore. We don't need to fight Greek philosophy because nobody accepts it. But at that time it was very important. So today also the role of Islamic economics is a temporary and short term. In the temporary and short term one is to fight Western wrong ideas. This is not the long run important thing. The long run important thing is to create an Islamic system. That is more difficult and that is what requires hard work. Now, one problem with creating an Islamic system is that <clears throat> even after revolution, now I come to the problem with the Irani and Afghani experience. Okay, we have our revolution. Now we are free to do whatever we want to do. How do we bring, create an Islamic economic system? There is a problem. <coughs> you see, um, the Islamic system has been lost. It was practiced for only a short time. And then a lot of deviations came in. And although the general idea was the, the way that the economy operated over in the Islamic empire over a thousand years was in conformity with Islamic principles. It's not that it was un-Islamic. But a lot of uh, extra material, things which were not purely Islamic, also got mixed in with the Islamic element. It was not, you cannot call it a purely Islamic system. But it was Islamic in spirit, very different from capitalistic systems. But over the past two to three hundred years, these systems were destroyed completely. And so completely that even their memory was lost. So today the Muslims in nearly all of the spheres of their life, the systems that are running are not Islamic systems. We look at the <coughs> political system and in Pakistan we have parliament and basically we have British system. Many other places uh, the systems that we are following uh, the governmental system is based on Western ideas. Uh, the social structures that we are using in Pakistan are product of the British colonial period. The market system, the economic systems we are using are product of British um, and the capitalist domination of the globe means that nearly everywhere the system of markets and of trading and of stock markets and of insurance and many other methods we are just following capitalist systems without any change. So nearly in every domain the, this university system this is not modeled on the Islamic university the Islamic University, the idea is that everyone who comes, it is our duty to educate them. I will be held question if somebody comes to me and asks for um, to be trained in ilm, then it is my responsibility to train him, not his responsibility. He does not pay money in order to get education. As, as a collectivity in, our, in the ummah, it is our responsibility to give training to every youth who is deserving. And we have to find the ways to provide the means, to provide the food, to provide everything that is needed. Anybody who comes, education is free for him. This is the Islamic spirit. How to implement it, that's a different question. But this idea that the student should pay fees to the university and the teachers are paid, this has very harmful effects. Today in the USA, uh, the student thinks of the professor as a hired person, as a servant, that I have pay, I'm paying you money, you teach me, you are my <laughs> servant in some sense, that it is your job. So this is um, the capitalist spirit. And in Islam, of course, everybody knows that in our tradition, very different. 
Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala said that if somebody teaches me something, I am his slave. So the importance of education, of teaching is very, very different and the role of the professor, of the ustad is very much honored and respected in Islamic tradition, not in the Western tradition. I was actually present at a seminar in um, University of Pennsylvania when I think Tom Sargent was delivering lectures, so he was very famous. So the whole hall was full. One of the professors came in, there was no seat for him, so he started, uh, he was standing and he stood there all lecture. All the students are sitting in front of him. I said, this could never happen in Pakistan. And he student would immediately get up and said, please sit down. Because at least so far, Islamic tradition is continuing and we still have respect for teacher. But it's declining. It's not the same as it used to be. <coughs> because the Western ideas are coming in more and more. So we have to prevent this. We have to go back to our own Islamic traditions. So I was saying that in nowhere, in, in none of the departments of our life, Islamic principles are operational. We are Because the Islamic institutions were destroyed in the process of the expansion of capitalism. So, now, the way the institution works is that it responds to the needs of the time. So, for example, in Pakistan, in, in Pakistan and India, we had huge numbers of Aqaf. And these Aqaf provided for education for all of the people and also health services for all of the people. Nobody had to have money to be treated because uh, the doctors would see everyone who is uh, poor for free. This was guaranteed. There is no, no question. If you go to any doctor, the best doctor in, uh, in our traditional society, he will not say, first bring me the money, then I will see you. This was considered to be inhuman. It was considered to be uh, very uh, zalil. You don't have dishonorable, <laughs> the right uh, words in English, you don't. <laughs> because they, the, the, um, they don't have really have concept of honor like we do. So, the, nobody would reject a patient because he has no money. This was our tradition. Now, of course, things are... But this has been forgotten. Now, still you can find people who are living up individually in this tradition and they will do this as a, on a personal basis. But this is not the part of the society. So, the Aqaf, they were captured by the British and destroyed and converted to other purposes. So, the idea that everyone can receive education free, can receive health service free, this idea was finished. Justice also, justice was freely available. It's no, not anymore. The British system is that you have to pay. Only the rich people can get justice. The poor person cannot get justice. He doesn't know how to hire a lawyer. He doesn't have money. If, he, if somebody does zulm, there's nothing can do except make dua. This is not Islamic. So, in uh, all of the domains of society, the um, systems that were Islamic were destroyed. Now, the system, if Islamic society had existed, and if these systems had not been destroyed, see, <clears throat> the, the question that I want to ask is, how can we get an Islamic economic system? Suppose that we have made a revolution, then how are we going to get Islamic economic system? We cannot at this point, even after the revolution. Why? Because the institutions that were Islamic were destroyed. Now, these institutions, if they had not been destroyed, they would have evolved. They would have seen, okay, in this time now we need such and such problem, Every system has evolved. The European banking system, as it was 200 years ago, is not the same as today. There's hundred, oh, hundreds, thousands of differences between. Because these 200 years, they have brought a lot of changes and everything has changed. 
So now, 200 years ago, we go back and we say, okay, Islamic system is what existed 300 years ago. Let's bring it. It will not work. Let's go back 1400 years and bring back the system that the Prophet ﷺ introduced. This will also not work because today's conditions are very different. What we need is the system and how it would have evolved had it been in existence. If there had been an Islamic system and it had faced the challenge of history and with the history circumstances it would have changed itself. So slowly it would have evolved and now it would be capable. But because it was cut off centuries ago, now we cannot imagine what it would look like today because everything is changed. So now we have to start it from scratch, from zero. And this requires a lot of ijtihad. We cannot, we cannot just say, okay, let's close our eyes and copy whatever was existing in the past that was Islamic. So <clears throat> what we need to do is to think about what Islamic spirit is and then give it some shakal, some body, which will be new, which will not something which has existed in the past. This was done by Muslims. When the Muslims uh, went out and conquered Egypt and got rid of lots of Roman territories, they came across many systems which were very complicated systems of governments, of taxation, of land tenure. Many things that, that they came upon. They had never seen before. They were living in a very simple society in Arabia with many things they, the, they are seeing for the first time. Indeed, there was a riwayat that one of the sahabi was shown the walnut. And he said, what is this? It looks like a stone. So then they opened it and um, they ate the seeds that came out from the walnut. So he was very surprised. The stone has can be eaten. But they were very simple people. They didn't have... So, <clears throat> despite that, they took all of these complicated systems and they Islamized them. They looked at something and said, no, this is not Islamic, get rid of it. Said, this is okay, it's compatible with Islam, accept it. So today, we, they made ishtahad on a very large scale. Today we need something similar. We need to <clears throat> reorganize businesses and... Uh, Many systems and Muslims are working on it actually. Um, the Islamic banking people, Islamic finance. But I think that in all of these places, our efforts are not, mostly, are not being done in the right way. Because what is being done is we say, okay, here's an Islamic, here's a Western idea that they have bonds. What is a bond? A bond is a uh, um, I sell you the bond and I promise to pay uh, more than the face value sometime later. Or sometimes you have income generating bonds. So I, uh, if you are the owner of the bond, then every month you will get $10. So this is the another kind. So <clears throat> the Muslim is okay, this is what the West has. Let's find a way in the Sharia to create something like this. This is copycat. That since the West has the best system, all we need to do is copy it. This is exactly the same problem as in Islamic economics. That we are trying to copy Western economics when we have a better system. So say that no, we don't need bonds. If the bond is like interest and it's haram, then we can do without it. So now what do we need? Well, look at what function the bond fulfills in the Western economic system and find something Islamic which fulfills the same function. Often we can find something better. It will not look like a bond. It will look like something else. But when you look at the function, so for example, uh, to give a very simple example, what we do with the bonds, oh, well, there are these widows and they have this income. They want some monthly money. They have this large amount of income, uh, money which they inherited from their husband. They put them in bonds and then monthly they have fixed payments. So this is what the bond is doing. Okay. 
So the problem is how to support widows. We have many ways. We have the Aqaf system. Widows have been supported throughout the Islamic history by Islamic methods which have no interest bearing element. They didn't use bonds. So, uh, okay, so we can find a way to support widows. Where is the bond? No bond. I can't see any bond. But there is an Islamic method to support widows. Okay, look at everything. What, what are the purposes that bonds are serving? So like we can find equivalence. And they may not look like it. So this is the problem. The Muslims are trying to imitate the Western methods. And not looking, they are looking at the Western means and not the goals. This is, where, this is why the Maqasidul Sharia Bahas is very interesting and important. Because some Muslims have realized it and they said, okay, let's look at the Maqasid and try to fulfill them. Instead of looking at the method and try to copy it. So this is why I think we are having problems with developing Islamic banking, Islamic finance, because we are trying to copy without thinking. And what we need to do is think. So, for example, some we were discussing automobile insurance. So, automobile insurance is haram in the um, standard understanding, because it is, it is a gamble. Now, if we look at the idea of automobile insurance, there are many different ideas. Uh, what happens if you have an accident? So now there are actually, even in the West, there are institutions. There are car clubs. The car club says that, okay, you join me as a member. And whenever you have a problem, I'll come and help you. Now this is perfectly Islamic. We form a club. When somebody's car breaks down, we all go and help him. Yani somebody is, this is Islamic idea. Insurance, it's not an Islamic idea. So even in the existing, um, now the idea is Islamic, but how to implement it? We have to think about. Similarly, <coughs> the idea of buying a um, car on installments. Now, uh, this is done by Islamic uh, variants of the, uh, mm, what do you call it? Um, have you studied this? If you want to buy a house on in installments or if you want to buy a car on in installments, then the Muslims have uh, developed some methods to copy it within the Sharia. The Islam, the Western contract, the mortgage contract, is very simple. <clears throat> um, I want to buy a house for hundred thousand dollars. I take a loan from the bank. Bank gives me a loan of hundred thousand. I pay the owner. Now I am the owner of the house, and now I have to pay. <coughs> the bank 10,000 dollars every year for 10 years and then I will for, for 12 years because I also have to pay the interest or maybe 15 years sometimes 30 years actually the <coughs> amount actual amount that gets paid is sometimes two or three times the original amount even with small interest like 8 10 percent so this is the western contract this is haram because it has interest but now the Muslims have come up with some contracts like Musharaka, Mutanaqasa and um, other ideas which are in principle compliant with the Sharia and also more or less equivalent to a mortgage contract. So I think that again what is do being done is uh, to try to copy a method and not look at the objective. The objective is to allow people to live in houses. Now, if we think about that objective, there are many ways to achieve and also to give them possession. Many people, once you think about the objective, then you can avoid uh, the problem. So, basically, uh, what has been happening is that Muslims are being too much copycats. They are imitating Western ideas. They are not thinking, they don't have the confidence to think that we have something better than what they have. They are thinking that we are behind them and that we need to catch up. All of these are wrong ideas. Actually, what the Prophet ﷺ gave us was much better than what they have currently, even now. So, uh, Islamic economics. So, what I was saying is that how to get the system? First, we need... Um, there are many ingredients of the system. There's the political, uh, there's the social, there's the judicial, there's the ma market, financial, insurance, 
social, many other systems, they all get, go together. Now we need ijtihad in all of the areas. But the very, yani, it's complex and difficult. It is not immediate, easy and obvious. In some areas, we can start some ideas which, which can be implemented directly without much support. Other Islamic ideas are very complex. In order to put it into place, you need to have five other different institutions in place. So if you start from there, you will fail. You cannot start. So we have to put them in the right sequence. Okay, this is an Islamic idea which can be practiced right now. This one we will need to wait for. So we, in every area, what we need to do is start with seeds. Very simple, small ideas which we start and we grow slowly. In um, Just like the Western banking system started. It started by, you know, people who were goldsmiths who were minting coin. They started uh, issuing notes saying that instead of taking the gold, you just take the note. And slowly it evolved into the money system. So today, the Islamic system, it has to start from zero. Uh, starting from zero, we have some, some institutions which we can borrow from our history like the Awqaf, but we have to be creative. It's not, it cannot be the same as it was. So today the effort is being made, uh, today ijtihad is being done in Sharia, the how to modify the Sharia to fit the West. But actually what we need to do is to modify the Western system to make it Islamic and the ijtihad has to be done in different area. Today the effort for ijtihad is being done in the wrong place. It is not, uh, uh, the Western system is taken as given that this is what we need to achieve and now how can we modify the Sharia to get there? This is not the thing. The thing is Western system is wrong. We have to make ijtihad on what the Islamic system would look like and how we can implement it. Just like I told you about the bakery. Just like I told you about um, um, car insurance. In every area, there are some genuinely Islamic possibilities which we can understand and we can start. And sometimes it will not be possible. Even in the West, you know, there are many institutions which depend on other institutions. So, um, the sequencing has to be right. So, the project of uh, developing Islamic economics is not an easy one. It's a difficult one. Ijtihad is required. For that ijtihad, we have, to understanding, we have to have understanding of both the Sharia and the Fiqh and also of Western institutions and how they work. But uh, we don't need to copy them. We need to improve upon them. And we can do that if the spirit is there. So I think that's enough for now. And I would like to take questions and discussion. Yes. Excuse me. What's your idea about the use of economics in Islam? Use of what? Econometrics. Econometrics. Okay, the econometrics is my own field of speciality and I can tell you that it is a way of deceiving people that I can use the numbers and the data to create a model. In every model, econometric model, data is used and assumptions are used. If you manipulate the assumptions properly, you can get any result you like. But this idea is not highlighted. It is projected exactly like the economics is projected as fact. I show you in the econometrics that here is the data. I don't show that my model is this one. In this I have made so many 50 different assumptions, none of which can be justified. And like the there is a linear functional form and then there are errors and these are independent and identically distributed and some errors are normal. and and, and none of this, for this, none of this I have evidence. So, but when I uh, present the results, oh, it looks like complete factual objective. And you cannot argue against it because I have used very sophisticated computers and models. So you say, okay, you, you must be right. So it is a way to borrow authority from data to convince people of things which are just guesswork. If you understand how to do the, make the assumptions, then you can make the data say whatever you want to say. They can sing whatever you, just like, you know, torture person, you can get him to speak 
So I can torture the data and make it say, say whatever I want. Yes? How we can forecast the Islamic economies? I don't understand. <coughs> economy. Yeah, and if you're talking about econometric forecasts, yes. then um, uh, there is a huge amount of literature on forecasting, and ultimately uh, there is no consensus on which methods work and which don't. And one thing that's very clear is that if we use very sophisticated methods, they fail. So simple methods which just extrapolate the data, they work quite effectively. And complicated methods based on econometric model quite uh, fail quite often. So the answer to the question is nobody knows how to do good forecasting. But we can make a convincing case, Rani, if I if I use the right terms and uh, complex models, I can convince you. And sometimes forecasting is done for this purpose. Yani, that's the thing. Why are you trying to forecast? This is what we need to focus on. What is the goal? So sometimes <coughs> forecasting is done. There is this book which is called, um, oof, I forgot the name, uh, about this person who was actually an agent. And he went to, I think it may have been Saudi Arabia, and he made them forecasts. <clears throat> and the idea of the forecast was to get them to invest heavily in American products. And so he forecasted that if you make these investments, then your economy will go like this. And it had nothing to do with reality, but so forecasts are made for some purpose. And when you understand the purpose, then you can do a better job of about forecasting. And normally, people are thinking that forecasts are objective like everything else. But it's not true. You, I can make any forecast I like. I, have, I know at least 17 different methods of forecasting. And so, depending on what forecast I want for the purpose that I want, I will choose one of those methods which give me something which I want to say. So, there is no objective answer to this question as to what is the best method to forecast? The issue will be, why, why are you doing the forecasting? Yes. If there was any politic power, any interest groups, uh, how help them, uh, I mean the giants of the science, to impose their theories to the people? Yes, this is a very good question and this is one that postmoderns have been in investigating in very great detail. How is it that theories, is it that Theories come to be believed because the older idea, the one that is being said is theory comes to be believed because it's true. Now we understand that's not the case. So then there is the question of how does one theory become adopted? How does it become displaced? It's not that uh, sometimes theories keep changing over, changing over time. So if it is not that this theory is true and this is false, then what is it? So there is a great deal of discussion and it's very complex and there is no, I mean, the conspiracy theory is that there is one person or a small group of people who have power and they impose their theories. This is obviously, it doesn't work like that. It's not that simple. Um, the process by which people come to believe things is very complex. It uh, doesn't have to do with just simple power configuration analysis. Although power plays a role, relation between theory and facts also plays a role. role. There are many other elements. It's a very complex question. It's a very important question to understand because what we want to do is eventually replace this theory. So people are believing wrong theories. Now how, how we can change their beliefs? Now this is something on which Islam provides a lot of guidance because the whole process of tabligh is about how you get people who are believing in jahiliya theories to Islamic theories. This is what the Prophet ﷺ spent his life doing and there's a huge amount of insight in and information in Islam about how we can carry this process. And it is not at all obvious. It's not something which... 
Unfortunately, Muslims think it's obvious. It's obvious. Muslims think that it's uh, yani how to persuade others is obvious. You just tell them the facts and they will believe. It's not true. Um, you just explain to them that three is not equal to one and Christians will become Muslims. But this doesn't work like that, unfortunately. Even though you can say that, look, how can three equals one? You have to be stupid. So when you say that, he becomes insulted. He doesn't believe your <laughs> argument. So how do you do that? It's explained in the Quran and the Hadith and the lives of the Prophet and the lives of the Sahaba. They all spent their time spreading the message of Islam to the whole human beings. And there's lots of information. Very complicated, complicated, not easy. Take Subhana Rabbika Rabbil Izzati Amma Isafun Wa Salaamun 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 Wa Salaamun